Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on cell phones and cancer risk. I am Dr. Barbara Malkus, President of the Board of Directors for the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And thank you for your patience as we were experiencing some technical difficulties. The Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition is dedicated to preventing environmental causes of breast cancer through community education, research advocacy, and changes to public policy. I am honored to welcome today's presenter, Dr. Devra Davis. Dr. Davis is an award-winning scientist and author. She is the president and founder of the Environmental Health Trust, a nonprofit that provides research education on environmental health hazards and promotes constructive policies at local, national, and international levels. Among Dr. Davis's numerous accomplishments, she has authored more than 200 technical publications and three books. She is the founding director of the Center for Environmental Oncology at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute and the founding director of the Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology to the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Davis, we are thrilled to hear from you today and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much. And thank you especially to all of your colleagues at the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition who have done such a great job in promoting awareness of the need to reduce environmental factors that can promote breast cancer, as well as advancing efforts to provide care to women at, at all levels of our society. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about breast cancer and wireless radiation. What do we know and what do we do now? I wanna dedicate this talk to Leon Bradlow, a pioneer in endocrinology and my esteemed mentor, who passed away this year with his wife, Hattie, uh, from, from COVID, and to Tiffany France, a brave breast cancer advocate who died last year at the age of 31 after 10 years, more than really half her life struggling, half of her adult life struggling with, with breast cancer from her cell phone. And I'll talk to you more about her in a moment. Um, I, my credentials are well known to many of you. And let's just say I've been around for quite a while and I really have become convinced that this is one of the largest underappreciated environmental health hazards that we have today. In 2010, as my third slide indicates, I published a book, Disconnect, The Truth About Cell Phone Radiation. That documented decades of research on the serious biological effects that were known as of 2010 and said that government limits now we know are quite outdated and today they are 20, uh, more than 25 years old. Um, when it comes to understanding why the environment is a cause of cancer, as I've said to many of you before, what we know is this, most women that get breast cancer do not inherit the risk. Only one in 10 cases of breast cancer comes about from being born with a genetic defect. What does that mean for us? It means that nine out of 10 cases of breast cancer that occur, occur in women without any germline inherited defect. So other reasons why we know the environment is a cause of cancer in my fifth slide, which you will have up shortly, is that if children are adopted, their risk of cancer becomes that of their adopted parents, not that of their biologic parents. That's a very profound indication that the environment shapes our cancer risk. Moreover, if we look at identical twins, which come from one egg split in half at conception, fewer than half of identical twins get the same cancer. So that is again telling us that even when they're close to genetically identical, over a lifetime of exposures, to what they eat and work with and live and play with, the risk of cancer differs. In addition, we know that migrants, people who move from Asia to the United States, develop the risk of breast and prostate cancer of the United States compared to the countries from which they come. And finally, we have patterns in workers uh, that are unexplained and 
give us indications of what the risk factors can be in the environment. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about animal tests, and I want to make sure to make clear the following. When it comes to studying animals, which we do to develop drugs and vaccines, every compound that we know causes cancer in humans will produce it in animals when adequately studied. That is why we do animal set studies to predict effects in humans and try to prevent harm. And just in the past few years, since I spoke with you last, the National Toxicology Program reports that cell phone radiation is a clear cause of cancer in male rats and also causes DNA damage in both rats and mice in several different organs. Now, why is that important? Because again, we use animal studies in toxicology to predict risk. That is what toxicology allows us to do. It identifies the causes of cancer under controlled conditions, because of course we can't study people under controlled conditions. But if we look at what we've done experimentally with electromagnetic fields, you can take a Petri dish and you can put breast cancer cell lines in that dish and expose them to electromagnetic fields. And you can show the inhibition of melatonin. Melatonin is what you make at night when you sleep in the dark without electromagnetic devices around you. Melatonin is a powerful natural antioxidant that heals damage from cell phone radiation and from all the other carcinogens you cannot avoid being exposed to in the natural world. <clears throat> what we know is that tamoxifen can be useful for, to treat estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. That's why tamoxifen is recommended in those cases. And what I'm going to show you shortly is experimental evidence that wireless radiation interferes with the capacity of tamoxifen to prevent the proliferation of breast cancer cells. If you expose breast cancer cells to tamoxifen, you disrupt their growth. If you expose them to cell phone radiation, you interfere with the ability of tamoxifen to work. A very important finding, while experimental, it has profound implications. Why do we know that melatonin is so important for breast cancer? Because epidemiologic studies provide some very important clues. Blind women who are constantly in the dark have very high rates of melatonin naturally, and they have half the risk of breast cancer of sighted women. Women who work at night are generally very low in melatonin, and they have an increased risk of breast cancer, and their risk is so highly increased that very recently the International Agency for Research on Cancer declared that light at night is a carcinogen. Now, as to the tamoxifen risk, I want to show you the slide from a publication some time ago where you could induce resistance to the benefits of tamoxifen by exposing breast cancer cells to electromagnetic fields. If you look at the, at the, the dose response curves here, you see a, a remarkable reduction in the number of cells that are cancerous when those cells are shielded from electromagnetic fields. But when they are not shielded, you see here an in increase in exposure to the electromagnetic fields and an increase in cell growth. So in other words, with exposure to electromagnetic fields, breast cancer cells will grow and become resistant to tamoxifen. Tamoxifen efficacy is reduced by electromagnetic fields. This is a very important finding that has implications for treatment of breast cancer and also for recommendations to women who have the disease to avoid exposure. But it suggests that there may be an effect as well on all cells from exposure to electromagnetic radiation. Now, microwaves have been demonstrated to interfere with membranes. And one study uh, done originally years ago by Alan Frey in 1975 and replicated by NITBY 
and Belyaev and Salford and Tang, they all show the same thing. Microwave radiation weakens membranes, particularly those of the blood-brain barrier, but those of every cell in the body. Weakened membranes can be vulnerable to exposure to, to other things. Um, when we look at patterns of breast cancer in the United States today, we see big differences in the ratio between incidence and mortality. With non-Hispanic white women, we have incidence is in fact about five times lower, uh, five times, I'm sorry, higher than mortality. So incidence is five times higher than mortality. For blacks, it's about three times higher. And for Asians, it's, it's also about four times higher. And what this is telling us is that the chances of dying of breast cancer are much, much higher for black women and Hispanic women relative to their incidence. The incidence is highest for non-Hispanic whites and mortality is lower for non-Hispanic whites than it is for blacks. Why is black mortality higher than whites? We don't have the answer to that question. Many people are trying to get it, but one thing we have to look at these clues to differences in the rate of death and incidents as suggesting that there are important factors in the environment and cultural factors as well that may be contributing to the fact that your chances of dying of breast cancer are relatively higher if you're Hispanic or black than if you are white. The good news is that death rates continue to fall for most women, but the bad news is that the race and ethnic factors are still very relevant. We look at other factors that we understand cause breast cancer. And this is work that was developed with Leon Bradlow. We know that the more exposure to menses in a woman's life, the greater her risk of breast cancer. The earlier that menstruation starts, the later that menopause begins, the more cumulative exposure to estrogen in a lifetime. Other factors that increase the amount of estrogen is obesity and the lack of exercise having no pregnancy, having a family history, and drinking alcohol. Drinking alcohol and early menses all increase the total lifetime exposure to estrogen. And the total lifetime exposure to steroid hormone binding globulin, which comes from the cumulative amount of estrogen, is the common link between most of these known risk factors. Other risk factors have been identified that also increase estrogen. And these include pesticides and the diet, particularly a diet that's high in refined foods and sugars, metals, paints, solvents, plastics, and both ionizing and non-ionizing electromagnetic fields. All of them increase the hormone levels circulating in women and this may be the mechanism through which they are involved in increasing the risk um, of breast cancer. This is very important work that has been done um, over many years, showing that the jobs with increased risk of breast cancer, solvent workers, chemists, nurses and dentists and physicians, painters and hairdressers, all of those professions have increased exposures to those agents that increase estrogen circulating in the body. And an additional exposure I'm going to show you now comes from exposures to electromagnetic fields, which also increases the amount of estrogen circulating. When we look at these human studies, we have to recognize that there are limitations. While we can study animals under controlled conditions, for people, we have to rely on questionnaires and we're always looking backwards. Animal studies allow us to predict effects on, in animals and show what those effects are likely to be in humans. That's the foundation of pharma, pharmacology. It's the foundation of vaccine development. It should be the foundation to develop environmental policies for protection. This, the, however, <clears throat> as we will see at the end, our animal uh, studies are not universally accepted as a valid study, a valid basis 
for expect for anticipating what human risks are. And that is, in fact, a huge problem for, for all of us. We have biomarker studies as well, where we look at chemical agents in the blood. And we have cross-sectional studies, which allows us to see patterns between high, medium, and low cell phone users, or high, medium, and low exposures to paints, hair dyes, and other things. And all of these different studies have value, but they're also limited because they are only looking at reported information or information that can be obtained retrospectively. Think of it this way. Toxicology predicts the future. Epidemiology confirms the past. And we have to be aware of the differences between them. It's very difficult to study people, as my slide number 19 shows. They seldom know all the things they've been exposed to. Breast cancer often comes about from prenatal and early life exposures, particularly breast cancer that occurs prior to menopause. And later life exposures are often not easily measured at the time of diagnosis. Finally, <clears throat> if we look, as we have at Cape Cod and Long Island, at residues in people with cancer, this can be misleading because exposures of, to relevant compounds can have taken place decades before we measure those residues. And that's why it's often challenging to do studies, as many of my colleagues have done, to look at residues in people when they are diagnosed. I want to show you a new study, however, published not too long ago by she and colleagues, where they looked at smartphone use linked to breast cancer risk. And they developed a scale of smartphone addiction. Now, we all know this, the smartphone addiction exists, but I was surprised to learn that scientists, and these are in Taiwan, had developed a scale of first measuring smartphone addiction. And they also combined it with a measure of reported use of cell phones within four and a half minutes before going to sleep. And you can see in the healthy controls, which is your at the top, um, the adjusted odds ratio, the AOR, adjusted odds ratio. This is slide number 22. Um, Shane, if you'll let me know if you got it on, I would appreciate that. Um, this slide um, clearly shows that patients who did not use smartphones addict in an addictive way and did not use them four and a half minutes before sleep had very low breast cancer risk. When you compare them with those who were addicted to their smartphones and did use their phones for four and a half minutes before night sleep, they had six times more breast cancer than those who did not have addiction or use their phones before sleep. And just using a phone before um, sleep and not even being addicted, but just using it before sleep, <clears throat> as you lying in bed with it close to the chest, obviously, those people had a threefold increased risk of breast cancer. So think of what this is telling us. This is adjusted for all the known risk factors. What we are seeing here, is strong evidence <clears throat> that smartphone use before sleep combined with the addiction to the device gives you almost a sevenfold increased risk of breast cancer. This is a very important finding. And it is ironic that we are not doing this kind of work in the United States today. I should say probably no accident because it's very difficult to do this research in the United States. But I hope that my call colleagues out there that are listening will encourage their doctors <clears throat> to start to ask questions about smartphone use and particularly using devices, including the iPad, just before going to bed, holding it right on the chest. <clears throat> now, we know that radiation, that is ionizing radiation from x-rays and CT scans, can cause cancer. There's no debate about that. There have been reports from the Institute of Medicine that the use of CT scans has increased fivefold over the last two decades. And because of that, they estimate a significant increase in breast cancer risk from unnecessary uses of CT imaging. Now, an unnecessary use is, of course, a relative thing. But the fact of the matter is, before you get that CT scan to your chest, 
make sure it's absolutely necessary. When it is necessary, it can save your life. But if it's not, you should reduce your exposures by asking for a regular x-ray and avoiding CT scans unless absolutely medically necessary. I want to show you a mammogram of a 56-year-old woman who presented with a firm mass, and you can see it in the top of her breast there. She came from Russia to the United States. In Russia, she worked with a hood. In the United States, she did not. And she worked with benzene <clears throat> for many years without a hood. And the consequences, in the opinion of her clinician, was that she developed this breast cancer. Benzene is known to be a breast carcinogen. Now, <clears throat> I'm showing you slides from a woman who consented to share them with us, who was a runner, a vegetarian, and Asian American. And despite having no risk factors, no inheritance of BRCA1 or 2, no inheritance of any other of the SNPs known to increase the risk of breast cancer, she developed tumors right under the antenna of the phone, where she kept the phone in her bra for years while driving in a car. Now, what's important about the driving in a car aspect of this is that when you are driving in a car, if especially if your phone is not tethered to the car radio, the phone will automatically go to max power. And as it goes to max power, each time it connects to a new cell tower as you're driving through, through space, that max power goes into all the antennas of the phone that are on. And as a result, you're getting very high levels of radiation into the breast. We know many women around the world have been putting phones in their bras and unaware that the breast being soft tissue will absorb high levels of radiation. In 2009, we had the first case report of the woman I showed you there, an avid runner, a Chinese American who used a cell phone for hours, four hours a day or more in her bra for 10 years while driving. This was reported by my colleague, Robert Nagorny, who was then the director of the National Cancer Institute Center at UCLA. Dr. Nagorny now runs his own center on um, personalized cancer care and has been a pioneer in identifying SNPs that are relevant. But he was astonished to see this woman who had no risk factors for the disease develop, again, tumors right under the antenna of the phone. This is the MRI from Tiffany France, which she shared with us some time ago in 2012. And you can see in the red highlighted area that she had metastases into the sternum upon first diagnosis. She was 21 years old. I want you to see this report here about what we know about the exposures. I'm going to try to run this video. Hopefully you'll be able to see it when, um, Sean, when you get to slide number 28, I'm going to try to play it right now. Um, Dr. Davis, I'm receiving messages from our <laughs> webinar participants that they cannot see the slides. And I understand, so I'm going to play the audio of the slide. Okay. I'm playing the audio of the slide. That's, that's, I understand that. Okay, thank you. Right. Special edition of Marketplace. Most of us carry our phones next to our body. And why wouldn't we? Science, tests, and the hidden message in your cell phone. So the tests are all done. Tests are all finished. And? The number exceeded the limit. It went up significantly uh, with each one of the phones. That's right. The phones exceeded the safety limit when they were moved right against the body. The radiation absorbed increased three to four times. Okay. This was a study that I just played from the CDC. It was done some time ago. Since then, the French national government has tested um, several hundred phones off the shelf. Now, why is that important? Because the way phones are tested in the United States, the tests are done 
by the manufacturer taking a phone they want you to test to a lab they select, running it through a computer device that tests the amount of exposure that it takes to heat up an empty bowling ball full of fluid to a certain temperature. Now that bowling ball full of fluid is called the standard anthropomorphic mannequin, and it is to supposed to, supposed to re represent the brain of all of us. That mannequin is far larger than most women and children, and yet that is the standard for testing phones today. It remains the standard. It has been the same test for more than 25 years. It is not adjusted for smaller people. It's not adjusted for younger people. It's not adjusted for children. And that is the method by which all devices are tested, even today. What the French government did was to take that method of testing and show that when you test phones directly next to the body, nine out of 10 phones exceeded the European standards. And Om Gandhi showed that when you test phones next to the body with the American standards, the levels exceed our current standards up to 11 times. So even though the current standards are not adequate, they are exceeded many times over when phones are tested directly next to the body. Now in the United States, they say phones are tested directly next to the head, but there's a little secret. Directly next to the head allows for a 10 millimeter or more distance for the ear. You know very well, if you're trying to use a cell phone, it's smack against your head. It's not away from your head. And so the way phones are tested is fraudulent. I'm making a statement as strongly as I possibly can. Do not deceive yourselves into thinking that those devices you're giving your children and yourselves should ever be kept directly on the body or used close to the body, certainly never in the bra. And so we have developed materials that you can have available from our website, which is ehtrust.org. If you look up breast cancer cards that say protect yourself, know what the risks are, know that you should never carry a cell phone directly next to your body, except on airplane mode, protect yourself, protect your brain and your fertility, and wherever possible, use a wired headset or a speakerphone. We've seen the skepticism when it comes to reports of endocrine disruptors. <clears throat> and there's a cartoon that, uh, that you can see when you get access to the slides about the manufacturing of doubt. That has been the response of industry. So long as people have doubts about the science, then it doesn't matter. If you think there's a question about safety, given the addiction that we have, all, all of us have, all over the world to these devices, it's very difficult. And that's why I'm grateful to the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition for this opportunity to talk with you today about the general advice that people should follow. Remember, uh, there's a movie, Thank You for Smoking. And at the very end of that movie, there's a very interesting scene. The movie is about the selling of drugs, guns, and alcohol. And the people who have that hard job, they get together once a week and call themselves the merchants of death, the mod squad. Well, at the end of the movie, there's a new recruit. And that recruit is a bunch of awkward looking guys in suits. And they sit there on the side and they're looking kind of uncomfortable. And from off camera, a voice says, well, is it true? Do cell phones cause brain cancer? And they get all uncomfortable and begin to speak all on top of one another. And the voice off camera says, listen, gentlemen, I want you to practice this. Look in the mirror and I want you to say, while we are concerned about the matter, at this point, there is no direct evidence that cell phones cause brain cancer. Now, direct evidence means dead and sick people. That's what that means. And I recently was approached by the former president of one of the major wireless companies who told me, you're doing the right thing. And 20 years ago, if I had known what I, you know now, we would never have proceeded to expand these antennas all over our country. And that is what is happening right now. We are seeing the, the commercialization and promotion of 
wireless radiation as though it's the greatest thing since sliced bread and you need to buy a 5G phone and a 5G router and a 5G laptop and 5G iPad in order to get into this system. Well, let me tell you something. There's been a backlash against this in some countries already. And we are really encouraged by the fact that more and more citizens are organizing to say, we do not want to have antennas in our backyard because that is indeed what is required in order for 5G to work. For more information on that, you can look at our website at ehtrust.org and you can get information on the fine print warnings that come with every one of these devices. It used to come in a print thing of paper that you could throw, that people threw away and nobody read. Now it's in the operating systems of the devices telling you that phones are tested at a certain distance. When Berkeley, California passed the cell phone right to know ordinance that said, if you carry or use your phone in a pants or shirt pocket, or tucked into a bra when the phone is on and connected to a wireless network, you may exceed the federal guidelines for exposure to RF radiation. When they passed that ordinance, of course, they were sued right and left. And while the ordinance was left to stay, the in fact, this industry will fight tooth and nails because they recognize that the most powerful agent that they have to deal with is the right to know and you have a right to know that there is non-ionizing radiation emitted by these devices and that they are not tested for children or pregnant women. And therefore, we are very excited by the activities at the local level, including at Montgomery County, including at um, in Petaluma, California, and all over this country and all over the world where groups are organizing to reduce exposures. And we, for more information about how to do this, please look at our website, ehtrust.org. And um, there are, we have links to some of our partners as, as well. And I think at this point, I'll stop and uh, take questions and comments because I'm very sorry for the problems we've had with the slides. But I will leave you with one thought. This is something that Bella Abzug advocated years ago. We need girl cots. A boycott means no. A girl caught means yes. We want to demand safer products for our children and ourselves, whether it's cosmetics or cell phones or flame retardant chemicals or routers that go to sleep. And yes, they can go to sleep. And yes, you can wire your home as I am wired in my presentation with you today. Let's expand to create a coalition to promote safer technology, something that we're working on right now. And we welcome all of you to help us in that regard. Again, for more information, go to ehtrust.org. And if you're interested in working with us, please send an email to info at ehtrust.org. With apologies, I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. Uh, again, we do apologize for these technical difficulties. Uh, maybe we can arrange with you to get access to the slides so that we can post it with the webinar on uh, mbcc.org. Um, I will invite any of our participants who have questions to click on the uh, side panel of your GoToWebinar where it says questions, and you can post questions or comments there uh, as we go along. But as we begin, um, Dr. Davis, thank you for this very, very important information. Are we seeing any trends in cell phones that are associated specifically with breast cancer, uh, in addition to the ones you've already mentioned? You know, uh, Dr. Malkus, uh, that is a really good question. And it would the only way we're going to get an answer is if clinicians start to ask. And we would love to work with you and some of the clinicians that you're working with to see that that happens. For example, the vocera devices that nurses are wearing, these often are worn right in the center of the chest, right? And one of my colleagues at NYU reports a number of people who have been nurse practitioners and others who are wearing these devices, having tumors right under where they wore the device. But that's just, an so at this point, it's an incidental clinical observation. Why? Now, I would like to see the Vocera devices worn on the sleeve, worn on the cuff, not worn at the breast. The breast, as you know, is fat. 
fat doesn't have any protection at all. That's why we, we heat things in the microwave oven. And yet we're putting these devices right on, right over the soft tissue of the breast. So we are aware of the problem. We know this problem exists. So why don't manufacturers provide warnings regarding this as an issue? They do, but nobody knows about them because they're buried. In fact, we have a whole section on our website of fine print warnings. They've been there all along. And, you know, um, in my book, I, uh, I have a whole chapter, read the fine print, you know, but obviously the warnings were written by the lawyers, you know, so they have warnings, but it, what does it mean if, if nobody reads it? Hmm. That's that's very concerning. You're, and you're correct that most of us don't necessarily read the fine print when it's a device or a product or tool that we use on a regular basis. Um, are there any related problems that, that have been identified, like other types of cancers associated with this uh, cell phone or technology-based electromagnetic radiation? And Dr. Davis, I believe, has frozen. Let's hold for a few minutes to see if she can come back. Ah, there you are. Dr. Davis, you, you froze for a moment and we don't it's have just audio sad. just yet. Okay, I do, I'm sorry, yep. So, so other related problems associated with this issue, other types of cancer, et cetera. Yes, in fact, um, the American Cancer Society sponsored a study at Yale University that was published a year ago by Dr. Luo, L-U-O, and colleagues. And what they found is that people with a particular type of SNP, um, um, that's a nucleotide excision repair, they had up to a fourfold increased risk of thyroid cancer with their cell phone use. Now, this is a common SNP. And so it clearly suggests that there is a risk of thyroid cancer. And if you understand where the phone is held and with the use, thyroid, of course, is being right here. Thyroid cancer has shown up. We're concerned about rectal cancer. Rectal cancer has shown up in uh, around the world uh, in, in younger adults. And in fact, a group of scientists with the International Agency for Research on Cancer recently published an analysis of time trends in early onset cancers and noted that colorectal cancer is increasing in young people in many countries. We published an article with Anthony B. Miller showing a four-fold increase in rectal cancer since 2010 under age 40 in the United States. Rectal cancer. Now, rectal cancer is caused by sexually transmitted disease. Obesity is a risk factor. But for a four-fold increase to occur from 2010 to 2020, we know all of these young people with the fashionably tight clothes and their phones tucked right in their tush, you know, what we also know is that you can do lab work with the, in the Petri dish with colorectal cancer cells. And if you expose them to this radiation, you radically accelerate the growth. So, so do other countries have different standards in the United States with respect to the use of cell phones and other technology? Yes and no. OK, on paper, our standards are stricter than the Europeans, but we don't test. We don't monitor. There's no agency out there routinely testing things. And we test cars with test dummies. And we do, you know, big, elaborate testing. And but there's been frauds in testing of, of cars with diesel engines. And our colleagues in France, PhoneGate Alert, believe that there have been frauds with testing of phones as well. And I and I concur with that because the test is rigged. It's rigged because it's designed so that phones can pass easily. Phones are tested for a six minute phone call with a big empty bowling ball. It doesn't simulate real world exposure. They're not tested in the in, next to the breast. They're tested next, supposedly in a 
dummy that simulates <clears throat> a 210 pound men, man. So we're, we're not testing these devices in the way that they're used. So while our standards may look more strict for phones, they are, by the way, 100 to 1,000 times higher for towers. India has stricter standards for towers than we do. Now, India doesn't enforce their standards. That's a, a whole other question. Um, and, and Russia and China have stricter standards. We have no way to know what they do, nor would I necessarily believe anything coming out of those countries at this time either. But on paper, they have stricter standards. Hmm. The European Union right now has issued new standards for testing devices based on what the French government did. They're moving to stricter standards of testing. We know that improvements in software and hardware could radically reduce exposures to these devices. Huawei made a baby safe router. You may ask, what is a baby safe router? Okay. Okay, it's a router that automatically goes to the lowest power needed, that turns, puts itself to sleep, except when it needs to be wakened up. This can be done. And so you're saving electricity and you're reducing radiation. We are radiating our children in schools around this country today. And much of the radiation that we're doing in schools today would be illegal in countries like France and Israel. Be illegal. And, and that's a really great point, Dr. Davis, because as a result of the pandemic, um, cell phones became that social link for many of our young people, particularly our, our adolescents, uh, for their ability to connect with peers throughout the pandemic. And so there was definitely an increase in access and use. Um, what is a recommendation for children using cell phones? What should parents be thinking about? Parents should be thinking that a child should not be having their own cell phone, frankly, in my opinion, until they've learned to drive, and then you wanna be able to know what's going on with them. They should know how to use them for emergency purposes, but we really do not encourage children to have their own phones. They lose them, they break them, and they use them inappropriately. And certainly you give a cell phone to a, a, um, a prepubescent boy, and let give them access to the internet and they're they're into porn within the hour it's actually there's studies have shown that so this is not helping our children to grow and become good healthy people and in fact it's associated with an increase in obesity and a whole host of other problems um, there's actually been research on adolescents and the adolescent studies on memory and spatial memory in particular show a significant decrement in memory with increased cell phone use in teenagers. Now, a study published by Moby Kids was a study of brain cancer. And they looked at brain cancer in children between the ages of 10 and um, I believe it was 19 or 22, okay? But the fact of the matter is only 25% of the children they looked at were in the age group were teenagers and older. Most of the children they studied were younger. And they only study them with exposures to cell phones of five years or less. The latency for brain cancer, we think, could be as much as 20 to 30 years. So studying children now for brain cancer risk in five years doesn't make any sense. What you want to do is what Leonard Hardell did in Sweden, which is start to study children when they were in their teens and elementary school and study them 20 and 30 years later. And what he showed is that the younger children were when they started to use cell phones, by the time 20 years had passed, they had a four-fold increased risk in brain cancer and sometimes an eight-fold increased risk. Wow. So obviously, the earlier in life a child uses a phone regularly, the greater their risk of that cancer. But I do not think that brain cancer is our worst problem here. I think that, um, frankly, the reduction and damage to the sperm and the effects on, on pregnancy are really the things we have to be most concerned about. 
So I always like to ask the question because, you know, this is very weighty information. It's, it's it, for, for so many of us through MBCC, we are breast cancer survivors. We want to um, contribute to our communities and our own, uh, be good advocates for our own health. So what do you recommend for the average citizen? What can they do today to help decrease their level of exposure now that we know this information start out with remembering this that this this risk can be completely reduced by simple measures get your phones off your body if you have to carry it on your body put it on airplane mode for any length of time i'm not talking about a minute but for any length of time do not get in the habit of having it directly next to your body all the time that's number one Pay attention to the signal strength. When the signal is weak, your phone drains out into its battery. So always put it on airplane mode when the signal's weak. But if it's next to you and the signal's weak, half of the radiation will get into you. And when we give you the corrected slides that you'll have access to, there'll be an animation showing how much gets absorbed into the breast. Because we are working with colleagues in Brazil now to provide three-dimensional animation of that exposure. Uh, understand that this is a long-term risk, right? So it's not like, oh my God, the sky is falling, but it's something you can easily take steps to do. Whereas most of the risks we've identified for breast cancer, as you know, things like prenatal factors, you can't go back and change your parents or what happened, but nutrition, you can't go back to that either. Although we know nutrition is important, but this is one where you can do something about it. And this is one where there is evidence for synergy so that it interferes with melatonin, it increases and accelerates the growth of uh, liver cancer in experimental models with a known liver carcinogen. So reducing your exposure, using a wired headset, using a speakerphone, that's what you can do for your phone. Keep things off your body. Remember four words, distance is your friend. I like that. Distance is your friend. So the, my last question um, that I have is around melatonin production. And uh, we have seen some studies that have shown that it's very beneficial to stop phone use several hours before normal, normal bedtime. Also to maybe consider not having any blue screen devices in the bedroom itself. What is yeah. your opinion on that, Dr. Davis? I think that's excellent advice. And I, as a number of, of um, clinicians are now advocating this for a variety of reasons, whether it's migraine or insomnia um, or difficulty concentrating or memory problems. All of these things have been associated with using phones at night. Sleeping with blue light is a no-no because blue light interferes with the production of melatonin, actually can can block it. So I try to use my blue light blocking glasses um, and keep them right next to my computer screen uh, so that I use them, you know, if I'm if I'm on my computer, you know, after dinner, that's what I do. I try, and I'm not always successful, not to be on, you know, after dinner. And um, and it's hard because you know we we these are very valuable devices and we're not at Environmental Health Trust, we are not anti-technology, we're pro-health, and we wanna make the technology safe. I think, it's, I think we should think about this like we thought about cars in the 1960s. We need the equivalent of airbags and seatbelts for phones. And I'm confident the engineers that are so brilliant, at, frankly, at engineering our addiction can also engineer safer devices. It can be done, patents exist, I'm working with some very smart engineers now on recommending ways to change hardware and software. We know this can be done. Well, thank you so much. That is the the a great way to conclude this webinar. I think the the takeaways are distance is our friend, and maybe especially as we are recovering from the pandemic, um, that we can start to think about how we use technology, when we use technology, um, so that we are reducing our, our risks 
and our exposure. So I, I think that it is a time for a reset um, in how, we're, how we are interfacing with technology and allowing for, again, interface with each other. So thank you so much for all of this fabulous information. Um, the two websites that I'd like uh, people to remember is ehtrust.org and uh, mbcc.org. We will be posting the recording of this webinar in about 24 to 48 hours, and we will include uh, 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 the access to the slides at that time. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And again, thank you, Dr. Davis, for a fabulous webinar. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, make some adjustments to those slides. So tell Sean just to wait a bit, okay? Great, thank you. Thank you, it was a pleasure.